Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, ki a hea ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Ko titi rangi te maunga, ko waiau te awa, ko ngai tamate rangi, ngā te hene wai atarua, me ngā te whaitanga hapū, ko ngā te kahungunu ngā rauru, me ngā te raukaua ngā iwi, ko rangi āhua te marae. Te kaipu tahi ranga haua hau, ko Kim Hamilton taku ingoa. Welcome to all and thanks for joining us this morning. I'd like to acknowledge the community groups and NGOs from throughout Aotearoa and also to those from government agencies who are looking for insight to inform your work. I acknowledge those who are joining us from other countries around the world. We appreciate that this is a time of many challenges for community organisations and our whānau. What Gloria, Tabby and Pooja have to present today is very relevant to how we can work to ensure that the voices of the rainbow community who are often marginalised in our work are better integrated. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to log in to the Community Research Facebook page and to post any questions for Gloria, Tabby and Pooja today. You can also do the same in our chat feed and in Q&A. If you want to be notified when we're broadcasting our next webinar, please join our Facebook group and Community Research Discussion Group. You can also sub subscribe to our monthly e-news by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. In our webinar today, we have a chance to learn more about what we can do as community organisations and in our research and evaluation to consider Aotearoa rainbow communities in our service and support. Supporting our rainbow community and mental health stems from a health focus. However, this session is a must view for people working in community organisations and for government departments who are often unaware of the range of identity diversity and how to consider and approach this in the 21st century. We have Gloria, Tabby and Pooja presenting on this from across organisations such as Inside Out and Rainbow Youth. The research and guide they are presenting on can be found at www.rainbowmentalhealth.com. Uh, Gloria Fraser has a whakapapa to Kaitahu and Kati Mamoi. She recently completed her PhD in the School of Psychology at Victoria University of Wellington. Congratulations, Gloria. Um, she's working as an intern psychologist for Hutt Valley DHB, uh, District Health Board, and she's particularly interested in the intersection of sex, sexuality, gender diversity, and clinical psychology. Her doctoral research focused on rainbow experiences of mental health and support in Aotearoa, and Gloria has previously worked as a research coordinator for the New Zealand Attitudes and Values Study and in voluntary roles for feminist and mental health organisations. She was a recipient of a Community Research Award for New and Emerging Researchers in October 2019. Tabby Besley, she, her, is the founder and managing director of Inside Out and identifies as a Pākehā queer woman. She has been volunteering and working in rainbow communities for 13 years. In 2015, Tabby's work was recognised internationally as she became the first and only New Zealander at the time to receive a Queen's Young Leaders Award. Since then, she's received a number of accolades for her work, including being made a finalist in Young New Zealander of the Year in 2020. Alongside her mahi with Inside Out, she's studying counselling and addictions and hopes to provide more specialised rainbow mental health support to her communities in the future. Pooja Subramanian is the Communications and Engagement Manager at Rainbow Youth. She was born in India, raised in Oman, and has worked in the family violence sector with Shakti Youth prior to joining the Rainbow Youth team. Pooja is particularly interested in the ways in which we can improve the health and well-being of queer, gender diverse and intersex people in New Zealand by educating the communities that support them. So thank you and welcome to Gloria, Tabby and Pooja. Over to you. Kia ora koutou, um, ka nui te mihi ki e koutou katoe, e o koutou tautoko e tēnei kaupapa. Um, ko Gloria aho, my name is Gloria. Um, thank you so much for having us here to talk and thank you to everybody who's tuning in. I'm trying to control my nerves as I see the number of participants kind of grow slowly um, at the bottom of the screen, but we will do our best to share and um, what we've come to today. Um, so I'll start by giving a bit of an overview of our project. Um, so as Kim said, this was the topic of my PhD project and it's one that I recently finished. Um, so the background for me is that I had heard from a lot of my queer and trans friends and um, people in the rainbow community 
that they had access therapy or mental health support and found it a really tricky process and not always felt like their identities were respected in that process. Um, and when I started off my own clinical psychology training, I soon realized that um, gender, sexuality, sex characteristics was not a big focus of that training. And it's something that I started feeling pretty concerned about. Um, and when I looked into it, there wasn't a lot of research in New Zealand that explored the experiences of rainbow people who access mental health support. And so it seemed like a really clear gap to me and it was something that I decided to um, explore for my PhD. Um, so you might not all be familiar with the term rainbow as an umbrella term. You might have heard different words like LGBT, LGBTQIA+, um, sexuality, gender, sex characteristic, diversity, minority sexes, genders, sex characteristics. There's lots and lots of different umbrella, umbrella terms that we use for this community. Um, and there isn't one right or wrong term. So there are lots of reasons for and against using all the different terms and a lot of it comes down to personal preference. Um, the reason that I went with rainbow for my PhD is that it's a really inclusive term so it's one that um, that nobody is kind of left out of which can happen with those acronyms like LGBT um, and it's also one that respects the strengths and the resiliences of rainbow communities and Tabby and Pooja might have a little bit more to say about language use um, when they come to talk about their organizations. So um, it was really important to me to take a community-based approach to this research. So that means that the researchers, so me at the university, collaborate with community groups like Inside Out, Rainbow Youth, and our other main organization, Gender Minorities Aotearoa, who are unable to attend today. Um, and there are a few really important reasons for that. One is that I think any research with marginalized communities should involve the communities themselves, nothing about us without us. Um, it makes the research better. It makes it relevant to communities. It means that researchers aren't locked up in the ivory towers doing something that potentially isn't actually going to help the people whose lives are affected. Um, the other reason it's really important for me to work with communities is that I'm not part of the rainbow community myself. Um, and there are a lot of researchers like me, um, straight, cisgender women, um, white passing women, who have done some pretty damaging research in these communities. So I thought that it was really important for me to go and meet with people and make sure that what I was doing um, was pika, really, was sort of relevant and was being respectful to the people that I was working with. So the way that we went about our research is we started off by interviewing a group of rainbow young adults who'd gone to access mental health support and finding out what it was like for them. And um, they told us that it was a pretty mixed experience. Some of them had had really great experiences with therapists who were validating and understanding and really supported them. And um, other people had had not so good experiences. And there was a lot of talk about a lack of knowledge about rainbow diversity in mental health professionals um, and also some not so great practice so people for example not being asked about their rainbow identity at all so they didn't really feel like there was space to explore that really important part of themselves or on the other hand people often talked about being asked a lot of questions about their rainbow identity and everything kind of coming back to that in therapy regardless of whether or not it was relevant and um, we followed our interviews up with a big survey that was completed by more than 1500 people throughout New Zealand and it came up with pretty similar results. So there's a mix in terms of mental health support um, of people finding therapy helpful and not so helpful. The other big thing that came out of our research was the importance of access to gender affirming healthcare for our transgender and non-binary people. So that's things like hormone therapy, gender affirming surgeries, um, and there's real disparities in terms of how people are able to access that throughout New Zealand and a real clear for, need for better access and better health pathways. So once we had all this information, we thought to ourselves, how do we go about sharing this with mental health professionals in Aotearoa? And we came up with the idea of a, res of a resource. Um, so this is what the resource looks like. We've got a couple here with me. It's a beautiful booklet. Um, we got an amazing artist, Bo Moore, on board who did these beautiful illustrations. So we've got um, native birds and plants all the way through the resource. So I'll just show it, show it to you. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, so it's really beautiful, really colorful. Um, and it gives lots of different background about um, terminology and language. It gives an overview of the research that we did um, and it provides lots of guidance on how to support rainbow people in mental health contexts. It also gives lots of information about intersections of identity. So there's 
heaps of diversity within the rainbow community. Um, so it talks about supporting transgender people, Takatapwe people, Pacifica rainbow people, um, intersex people, asexual people. And if all of these words are sounding not quite familiar to you, um, check out the resource because it's got lots and lots of detail about different language to use. Um, it also has links to websites like Rainbow Youth's website, Inside Out's website, which has heaps more great information. Um, we also have a website that comes along with it, and I'll just share my screen and show this to you. So this is the website, um, rainbowmentalhealth.nz. And if you have a look, it's got the resource all there for you. Um, so you can download the resource, not only in English, but you can also download it in Te Reo Māori. Um, and that's really exciting too. We also have a translation in Mandarin Chinese. We also have these really beautiful posters that you can put up. Um, so one's about inviting people to share their pronouns. Um, also just a nice welcoming one there. Oh, I've got my co-presenter Poppy joining me here, as you can see. Um, and all of these resources are free. You can also order hard copies of the resource by going to the part that says order resources. And I believe that they're being sent out by Rainbow Youth as well. Is that right, Pooja? Yeah, so they're being sent out by Rainbow Youth and I think they've still got some posters too. Um, and these resources and posters are not just helpful for people working in mental health contexts, um, they're really helpful for use in any organization where you're gonna come across Rainbow Fano, which is every organization. And um, so really encourage you to kind of check those out. So I'll stop sharing now. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's all from me in terms of an intro, so I'm going to pass along to my wonderful co-presenters, but um, yeah, here to answer your questions, and I'll just give you another glance at my beautiful cat, who's also very excited about the webinar. Kia ora. Kia ora tato, called Tabby Besley Toku Ingwa. Uh, thank you so much to Community Research for your support, firstly, of this research and, research and for having us um, along today. Um, yeah, I guess, firstly, I'll just introduce um, Inside Out a little bit. So um, Inside Out Kuaro, we are a national charity. We've been around for um, eight years. Uh, and our work, or kind of our vision statement, is really to um, support all rainbow young people across Aotearoa to have a sense of safety and belonging in their schools and communities. Uh, and our sort of point of difference or real focus is on that um, schools and education space. So um, we have a team of schools coordinators who kind of go in and um, walk alongside schools around the country to support their journey of rainbow inclusion, supporting our rangatahi. Um, so that's sort of the big um, focus of our work and doing a lot of advocacy and um, yeah, working with the Ministry of Education and kind of other um, yeah, providers and government departments to really um, support that change in schools. Um, we also kind of have a social enterprise arm of our work where we do a lot of um, professional development and consultation with um, organisations across a really um, broad spectrum. So from uh, government agencies to, to schools, to workplaces, to, um, to social services, to, to um, counsellors, youth workers. Um, and that's, yeah, really about just providing that kind of training, professional development and opportunities to develop their understandings um, of rainbow communities and inclusion, because most of us have never had the opportunity to learn about it. And still in our schools today, it's not being taught um, to the degree that we would like it to be. So it's actually quite normal for this to be quite a new topic for people. Um, so I guess our work is really about trying to, um, yeah, support people to build some confidence to work with our community to, to build some of those understandings. And um, so we use this resource um, a lot within that training and are able to come um, and give it when we do trainings, um, particularly for those working in the sort of social service sector, which has been amazing. Um, and we also run a bunch of kind of youth development programs for Rainbow Young People and, and do a lot of things, I think, um, between Inside Out, Rainbow Youth and Gender Minorities as our three sort of um, big national organisations working in this area. Um, and they're often actually in Aotearoa, there isn't much, um, many organisations or support outside of the sort of youth bracket. So we do sort of end up being called in to, to do a bit of everything. Um, so a very, yeah, very diverse uh, amount of work that we do. So to speak to the research process a little bit, um, yeah, I guess just really, it's just been incredibly, um, incredible, wonderful to work alongside Gloria um, along with this. And I think what happens, you know, almost every week we receive emails um, from researchers saying, oh, can you please promote my research or I want to include rainbow people or um, that kind of thing. But often they've come to us way too late in the process for that to be a, a, a really authentic or um, a well done thing, I guess. Um, 
so often we you know then we have to look at the information we may have to actually say sorry the language that you've actually used isn't um appropriate or it's not actually kind of what you know the best practice and that could actually really alienate or be harmful to our um, communities if we were to send that out um as just one example so what um, inside out really appreciated about working with gloria is that she came to us right at the the start of the process and worked in partnership with us and these other organizations um, throughout the whole process so that meant um you know co-developing questions for the interviews and the the survey that went out um us taking a really active role in um, promoting those opportunities and, and getting participants um being able to ensure diverse voices from our organizations were, were seeking into that process as well for us to say actually these are the biggest needs or um yeah those kinds of things um and doing that process together was just yeah amazing and um unfortunately still yeah quite unique in research so um yeah for us it didn't feel like the typical kind of interaction that we're used to it was yeah a really true partnership um and also really great to be working alongside these other organizations um for us to kind of come together and collaborate on um, a resource like this too but one of my copies too to, to show off um yeah and i think for us as well with research often we don't get to see the outcomes or the results of that so we may um, contribute a lot to helping people get participants or feeding in um but it's not always that people will bother to come back to us and kind of say well you know here's what i've produced or here's the results of that um unfortunately and so it was actually yeah just so wonderful because for us the rainbow sector is quite under resourced and quite underfunded in our community sector um as we all are but you know to another kind of degree um and so for us a project like this is something that we you know have wanted to do for a long time and it's a huge need for our communities to be providing more support in the area of, of mental health and upskilling professionals but there's only so much we can do and i guess a barrier that we have uh, faced in trying to engage with organizations um again is that resourcing is that um for us it's not a part of our work we have any funding to deliver that training so we have to ask um you know for a, a fee or call half for that um, and then not all organizations are willing willing to or maybe have their own resource to do that so having a resource like this has just been um amazing to kind of help reduce some of those barriers because even if we can't always come and do that training should fully you know always recommend alongside something like this um at least it's something that we can can offer um for free and a way to particularly for individual practitioners to be able to um yeah kind of upskill and yeah it's just really comprehensive and glory was incredible throughout the process as well as just taking on any feedback even kind of late in the game of saying oh actually i think we need a page or a section on this um this small part of our community because if we're covering these people we should cover these people and yeah just trying to make it as inclusive as possible so yeah i think that's probably enough from me for now but yeah it's just been a, a wonderful process and would love to work with more researchers who um go about th things in that in that way um and I think to would add that Gloria, I guess, really um, the way she went about this research was not to put extra like stress or responsibility onto our organizations, if that makes sense. So in a way that really enabled us to give that feedback and be part of the process in a way that suited us without demanding a huge amount of time or a meeting to look at every single thing or, you know, like um, just, yeah, having a really a flexible approach that enabled us to, to speak up when needed, but also for her to just, to, to get along um, and um, do things kind of efficiently. So um, yeah, if you're interested, would definitely recommend um, learning more about how she's kind of done this. Cool, thank you. I'll pass over to Pooja. Morena koutou, um, ko malam te maunga, tō meneru te awa, i tai mai rawa ki Aotearoa i te tau rua mano māwha, um, a hakoa nō whenua ki o kutipuna, e noho ana a hau inai nei i raro i te maru o maunga whau, te maunga tapu o te iwi ngā te whātua, um, ki te mahi a hau ki Rainbow Youth, ko Pooja Subramanian tōku ingoa, um, I'm Pooja, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager at Rainbow Youth. Um, pretty cool to be here. Similarly to Gloria, I'm trying not to look at the numbers of the participants increasing. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just, a little bit about Rainbow Youth. Uh, we've been around since 1989. 
um, started off as, I guess, like a series of small social support groups for those who wanted to find connection and community in a sober space. Um, and over the years, obviously, we've expanded to a more national reach, like Tabby mentioned. So um, we provide one-on-one -on -one support to young people aged 13 to 27 across the country. Um, and some of that support can look like one-on-one -on -one support with um, I guess gender identity stuff, so that includes transitioning, um, some peer support, accessing social support groups, um, advocating at school, university, workplaces, things like that. Um, and also, like Tony mentioned, delivering workshops around gender and sexuality to anybody who's keen to listen, really. Um, I think I would definitely echo a lot of um, what Tabby mentioned about why this resource is important. I'm sure we've all heard of some of the shocking stats that have been coming out. Um, we know last year's Counting Ourselves study basically showed us that trans and non-binary people are nine times more likely to experience mental distress in comparison to their cis and straight counterparts. And that I think is enough reason for us to know that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I guess, in saying that as well, it's important for us to work with the communities that support young people and not just rainbow young people, because I think a lot of the time people, um, one thing we find is a lot of people say like, oh, we don't get those kinds of people here. Um, statistically, that's just not true. So I guess that's why this kind of research is really important because it's like Gloria mentioned, um, not about us without us. And I think the accessibility piece of it is also really important. So making sure you can just kind of pop online and read stuff. You can command F and search a word if you need to. Um, and I guess that also has a bit of some things that we wish we could have done more. So like writing more about some of the intersections within the rainbow community, for example, migrant young people, um, for takatapui young people, and also for like the MVP FAF community that's, um, yeah, definitely a lot more information that we could have put out there. But so far, it's had an amazing reach. Um, when I looked at the amount of views just before we started, it's had 11,700 views, the website, um, which is really great to know that that many people are kind of trying to learn and, yeah, be a part of this journey with us. So that's me, really. We've had a couple of questions come up from our participants today um, while you guys have been talking. So I might just throw those over to you and you can choose who responds. So um, Shyana had a question about, uh, is, are there Māori models of rainbow health support or resources that it, do you know of? So like Māori models of mental health support for rainbow communities? Yeah. Yeah. Not that we know of. Um, I mean, there definitely is like a lot of Māori mental health practitioners that, mm. um, you know, there's like models like Te Whare Tapawha. There's a lot of models out there that people are using, but mm. it, um, making it very specific is not something that we really see. Um, and that is something that I think would be awesome to have as like a lead up um, from the work we've been doing in this resource. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And I'll just uh, add on to that, if that's all yeah, right. Go. Um, so there is some fantastic work being done by Dr. Elizabeth Ketakiri, um around takatāpui. So if you don't know the term takatāpui, that's the um, term for somebody that's both Māori and part of, part of the rainbow community. Um, so if you go to takatāpui.nz, I um, can put that in the chat, um, there's some really great resources that were developed in um, partnership with the Mental Health um, uh, Foundation as sort of suicide prevention resources. Um, and a lot of it's sort of sharing stories and... Um, yeah, I guess just talking about the fact that um, diverse sexuality and gender has always been part of Maori culture and sort of reclaiming that. So um, those have been incredible resources for our organisations to utilise. So I'd highly recommend those. And um, uh, Elizabeth also, she has been working on a framework um, which is sort of based off Te Whare Tapawha, um, but it's called Te Whare, um, tapa, uh, te whare um, Takatāpui. So it's, mm -hmm. um, she's just written a... Um, drafted a chapter on it which will be I'm not sure quite where it's um where it's being published um but I was honored to get to um to read through it and it's yeah um really powerful so uh, yeah there is some some kind of work being done in that space thanks Tabby thanks Pooja um and Kay also had a question around um support for older rainbow youth uh, for older rainbow youth older, the older rainbow community members and about how they often suffer from feeling a little bit invisible, I guess, in comparison to maybe some of our younger, younger communities. So 
So um, would you like to, does anybody have any idea about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, um, as Tabby mentioned earlier, like a lot of us are in kind of the youth sector, um, but there are definitely spaces and groups for older rainbow communities. So outline um, their counselling services are not youth specific, so anybody can access those. There's also a bunch of, I guess, kind of like smaller communities that have been formed. There's one called Silver Rainbow. Um, and I know that um, organisations like Outer Spaces and Gender Minorities Aotearoa don't have like an age bracket kind of thing. Um, and I guess, Auckland specifically, there's also a group called Gender Bridge, which is mainly for um, the older trans community. But yeah, I think that's definitely a space that needs a lot more spaces in. Do you know if there's any published resources that can help? No, no. I mean, this resource, again, it's not age specific, so it would be absolutely appropriate for practitioners working with older people in the rainbow community. Unfortunately, it is a real gap that there haven't been, and this, sorry, I would add the same for those takatapui, um, the main resource there is also kind of, and that profiles people across ages, which is really awesome. Um, but unfortunately, there are no real um, resources or um, organisations or funding that's kind of been channeled into that kind of specific part of our population. So it is a real gap and um, we wonderful to see more people, um, I, yeah, I guess kind of making initiatives in there. So that could be a research project for someone. Yeah. And I'll just add that, um, as Pooh just said, there were lots and lots of areas where we would have loved to do more work in our resource and our research. And um, for me, older rainbow adults was one of our gaps, I think. Um, so we did have survey participants up to, I think, in their 70s. So we did collect data from older adults, which was really exciting. Um, but it was something that I think we could have spent a lot more time on and we just really didn't have a lot of New Zealand research to draw from. Um, so like Tabby says, I would absolutely love to see someone take this up and, and do their own project on working with rainbow older adults because, yeah, I think it's a really, really important area. You've touched quite a lot on, I guess, the community health and education sectors. Are you seeing, um, I guess, how, how are you finding uh, the private sector? In, in terms of how they support rainbow communities? Are, there, are you doing much work with them? Um, we didn't hear from a lot of people who had accessed care privately. Um, and that's probably because it's so expensive. And we know that rainbow people do um, experience income inequities. And a lot of that is down to ongoing kind of prejudice and discrimination. Um, so the people in the research who had accessed care privately often described it um, really positively, but they also acknowledge that that came with a lot of privilege to be able to pay, you know, 150 or $250 an hour to go and see a therapist. And so the real gaps do seem to be in our public system um, and real access gaps there. Um, it's also worth noting that it's not just our public system that's really overstretched at the moment. Like in Wellington, I'm not aware of a private psychologist who doesn't have a great big long waiting list. So even when people do have resources to go privately, it doesn't mean that, um, that access is immediate. Um, you guys touched on, uh, I think it was you Tabby, touched, um, touched on the issues of ethics really in terms of people conducting research across rainbow communities. Um, would you like to expand on that and maybe give some advice to our community organisations or how you think issues of ethics um, shouldn't, should or shouldn't be <laughs> approached, uh, you know, by, by researchers? Um, I think the main thing is just the whole um, nothing about us without us thing. I think um, doing it alongside, um, I guess, like frontline workers or people um, actually facing the issues from a community level can make a huge difference in, I guess, like the validity of the research and where it goes after the research process. So obviously, you know, Flory could have written a really shiny PhD, um, but it wouldn't have really had as much of an impact if we shouldn't put all of this work into, um, I guess, making that accessible with community organisations. So I think that piece of kind of um, working with the communities that you're doing research about or from or to is really important for us. I guess um, one of the, just to add to that, I think, you know, um, Oh, what is my question? Do you think there's enough ethical consideration of rainbow communities and I guess in research across the set, you know, across Aotearoa? <laughs> no, and I'll tell you why. 
even just the real basics like if we think about the way that we ask gender on any kind of survey form it's really really common for people to use something like a male female tick box which um, often conflates sex characteristics and gender but also assumes that there are only two genders and we know that there are many 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 more than two genders and there are really easy ways to respect rainbow people and asking your survey questions so asking for example what is your gender and then providing an open box um, I think that New Zealand's ethics committees are only just kind of tuning into this sort of thing and an easy way that ethics committees could be um, being inclusive and respectful of rainbow people is by attending to those little things and um, the other thing is that a lot of the community research considerations are not the forefront of ethics committees minds and, and often it is more of a kind of tick box you know have you consulted with the people that you are working with or working for um, and so what I would like to see is researchers need to provide evidence of really solid and genuine community engagement if you're working with any community group. Um, I've got some other questions here around um, really just because we've come out of COVID and you know were special efforts made I guess or how well were rainbow community supported during COVID-19 because we know it definitely had an impact on the mental health and some of the um, issues that face us all but was this were there any specific efforts um, that happened at the time and how could we as a sector do, do a bit better perhaps? Mm, um, I think it's kind of pretty um, obvious that mental health was a huge issue throughout COVID-19 and the numerous lockdowns we've had especially in Auckland um, one thing that we did kind of see happening a lot was um, school counselors trying really hard, teachers trying really hard to kind of provide that support for young people, but being stretched already. And mental health services from like a public um, perspective have a long wait list. So it's kind of just made the wait list barrier more and more difficult because not only can you not find someone to help, let alone finding someone who understands what gender and sexuality means. Um, and I guess what we've tried to do is kind of make sure the support services are still accessible. So that means things like going online, um, using kind of platforms and software that young people are actually using. Um, I think emails and stuff are unfortunately not something that's, um, I guess, very accessible for young people. And especially thinking about rainbow communities, you know, having like a um, space in your house that you could do a Zoom meeting without your parents finding out, all those things make um, I guess accessing support a lot harder. So I guess throughout COVID-19, we're kind of, um, the main thing we're trying to do is make sure they still have access to connection and community in some kind of way. So whether that's online groups or online events or things like that, but just making sure that that kind of um, feeling of being a part of something is still there. Yeah. I would um, add as well, that I think unfortunately we, what we didn't see was we saw some, um, some marginalized groups were prioritized in kind of, in funding or government responses um, and um, there was you know sort of one exception but aside from that pretty much rainbow communities were were dismissed even though particularly um, I guess from our experiences and international research and the and now the research we know that NYD has the Ministry of Youth Development sorry has done and is doing showed that rainbow communities particularly our young people were more disadvantaged from COVID-19 so um, I think yeah in in the kind of response from government and um, I guess if it you know does to continue that's something we would like to see a lot stronger that has sort of been neglected um but i think i would say that our particularly our youth organizations around the country did a really amazing job of you know jumping online um really adapting a lot of the things that we were doing you know but inside out we um put on a series of kind of extra workshops and things to help people stay connected we took unfortunately our four-day hui that usually happens on marae um we you know that was quite early on in the lockdown um, and we had to you know obviously weren't able to do that in person so we turned it into a two-week online event instead um, and we were quite worried about about that and if we'd still um, experience the same kind of outcomes for our young people because usually they tell us that when they leave that they feel um, more confident to overcome mental health challenges in the future and um, they've felt the sense of belonging and connection to their community and so on um, and we didn't know if we'd create that same kind of feeling of, of whānau and connection over, um, over Zoom and Discord, which were the platforms we used for it. And um, the kind of feedback told us that actually we still managed to do that. Um, we did, you know, a talent show over Zoom, which was amazing. <laughs> um, so it was really cool to see our young people, um, those that were able to access it, because of course not everyone was um, getting into that um, and everyone just sort of, yeah, adapting. So there, there were things going on, but 
really driven and led from our organisations, not really um, kind of heavily supported from government. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a question about the resource, and um, the participants are really um, happy to see that it's available also in Chinese and Māori. And uh, the question is, uh, was this was this a difficult process, or how did you go about uh, translating your resource? Yeah, um, it, it was a bit of a difficult process, and one of the big things that we came up against was um, funding. You know, we were really pushing hard to get funding to get the resource illustrated, designed, um, printed, and then translation was another thing that we felt really passionate about. Um, so we were really, really lucky to um, get in contact with Hemi Kelly, who is a translator and lecturer in Tvera Māori at um, AUT, and he um, basically translated it for us for mates rates. And um, same with our Chinese Mandarin, um, Jia Bao Zhao, who works with gender minorities, Aotearoa, did our translation. And what was hard about um, translating into both of those languages is a lot of the words that we have in Te Rapakia, um, those more kind of specific words like non-binary, agender, asexual, etc, etc. Um, a lot of those don't exist in other languages yet. And so what Hemi did for um, the Māori translation is he got together a group of translators and he's Takatapui himself and um, consulted with other Takatapui and they came up with a lot of new words um, and put those throughout the resource. And that was really exciting. Um, but what we didn't have time to do is to put all of those new kupu through really good rounds of community consultation. Um, so what we have done is put out our Te Reo Māori translation and put it forward as sort of a starting point. Um, and we think that there's a lot more work to be done in working with Māori communities to say, do these words resonate? Um, are there other words that might work better? Do we need to have several different words? Because um, we know that there isn't just, you know, one word to word direct translation from Te Reo Pākehā to Te Reo Māori. Um, for Chinese Mandarin, my impression was that Jia Bao was very much working Working more by himself in that kind of um, context, which I imagine would have been really challenging. And we're really, really grateful. And so um, instead of directly translating all of these words, there's sort of English words scattered throughout our Chinese Mandarin resource to account for it being quite hard to translate some of those more specific words. Um, so yeah, it was a really challenging process, the translation, but I'm really proud that we were able to put it out, not just in English and um, you know obviously there's so many more languages that we could and would love to um, translate the resource into so that might be a future endeavour. Um, we've also got a question from Adam who um, is asking uh, really about your views for of, cri of what happens in terms of crisis support for rainbow communities. How appropriate I guess are the crisis support services that exist in mental health? I think um, the mental health system is already pretty stretched for everybody in general. So obviously those barriers are a lot more difficult for rainbow communities. Um, like I mentioned before, things like already long wait lists, um, not being able to, I guess, like find someone who understands the cultural context that you might need, um, the intergenerational context that you might need. There is a lot of, I guess, work to be done in the education space for mental health professionals. Um, so yeah. I, it's not looking too flash. <laughs> yeah. My question, sorry, I might just add there. Okay. I, yeah, probably should be a bit careful about how I talk about our public mental health services as a DHB employee, but I think that probably everyone could agree that, um, that we could do more to resource all of our crisis services. And what we tend to find is that across mental health, if there's any area where there's room for improvement, you can pretty much bet that there's gonna be extra, extra room for improvement for rainbow people. Um, and for pretty much any other minority group, eh? so same for Māori, for people with disabilities, for older adults, for, um, yeah, so there's already these kind of gaps. And then for, um, for our minority or marginalized groups, the gaps just tend to be bigger as a general rule. And I think um, same goes in crisis services. And also worth noting that when people are in crisis, there's often not as much time to do things like read through people's notes or get a really good understanding of background. And where I've seen um, that be a problem is in things like respecting people's correct names and pronouns, you know? So it tends to be in crisis that people are more likely to make those leaps and assumptions because they have to be moving quicker. So it would be great to see um, better processes and crisis services for, yeah, respecting people's names and pronouns, even when we're in a rush. Thank you both. Um, we've got a question from Ella, who's an OT 
um, occupational therapist, I'm assuming. She's a student and she identifies with the Rainbow community and she's wondering if there's uh, support for, or any particular, I guess, yeah, guidance or support for occupational therapists working with Rainbow communities. Not aware of anything. Um, I know, uh, we've been talking with one training provider about whether we can support some kind of rainbow inclusion training within their program for OTs. But um, uh, yeah, I guess what we would recommend is, is this resource and, um, and, tra and training. So always feel free to get in touch with Inside Out or Rainbow Youth or um, depending where you are, we can co connect you to um, yeah, someone more local. Yeah, I think we definitely see this resource as being for anybody who really works. It's, I guess, called Rainbow Mental Health, but it's definitely still helpful for, you know, occupational therapists, like literally anybody who's working with a rainbow person. Um, sorry, I just saw someone posted a resource in here. There's, there's quite a lot of questions coming through in the Q&A that are either specific or I've noticed that the that other panellists, uh, other attendees are kind of picking up and answering those. So apologies yes. if I miss any, miss any important ones. I guess um, I'm really interested in what we can do when we're designing, I guess, community services and community programs. Uh, how can we better do this and, you know, with thinking about rainbow community needs? Um, I guess... At Rainbow Youth, we kind of always try to talk about it as like um, more of a journey and there's a bunch of phases to it rather than just being able to kind of, you know, like if I print out something and give it to you and then you just go tap, 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 like we're Rainbow Family. Unfortunately, that isn't how it works. So things as simple as um, who's the service for, like is it, you know, the way you talk about gender, the way you talk about sexuality, um, how visible it is for Rainbow people to want to go there. Um, how if there's any kind of like community leaders active in that space are they present um is there cultural understanding of rainbow communities just yeah i think kind of um i know people in the sector call it co-design which i don't really like that word but i guess <laughs> that kind of stuff where um I guess the communities that you're trying to make sure you represent are there along every step of the way. So not just in the way where at the beginning it's like, oh yeah, we talked to a bunch of gay guys and then now everything's fine, but trying to make sure that those are kind of carried through all the way. And just from a researcher perspective, I might add in there that um, when people are not part of rainbow communities themselves, I think a big barrier to doing community-based work is fear of getting it wrong and making mistakes. Um, and that's something that I definitely experienced a lot earlier on in my PhD like I had real fears of making a misstep and kind of getting permanently cancelled by the rainbow community and out together and not being able to finish my PhD and all these different things and um, the truth is like we are all going to make mistakes and missteps it's absolutely impossible to go on any kind of journey without you know getting it wrong some of the time um, and that what's really important is about intent and the spirit behind it um, and also facing up to mistakes and apologizing for them and acknowledging it um, and I think any community is going to be understanding of that and and yeah more more focused on where your heart is rather than um, getting it perfect or using the right words all the time so my advice would be to get out there start building relationships and um, and not to be afraid of that or let that hold you back. Yeah, and I feel like even for those of us who work in this sector, it's not really like we're like the experts. I think it's just um, sometimes these, all these terms and everything can feel really complex. But at the end of the day, I think it's just about having compassion and empathy and trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And I think you don't have to be part of the rainbow community to kind of have that and be able to provide that. So, yeah, definitely agree with what Gloria said about just get amongst and if you get it wrong then at least you learn something out of it. Um, one of the other questions I've got in my kind of uh, little toolkit here is um, thinking about this, the importance of this sort of work, engagement with rainbow communities and their rights actually, their rights to be included. Um, do you guys have any reflections on that? Um, yeah, I think um, so like we're thinking legal rights, human rights perspective. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, an area that we would like to see a bit more work done. Um, separately to this resource, Rainbow Youth did develop a Rainbow Rights resource, which is a website 
um, it's just called rainbowrights.com, I think. Um, and it kind of goes through like all of your rights at, at home, at work, at school, um, from a legal perspective. But I think from like a human rights perspective, um, our laws don't really exist to protect us um, in the way that they should. So I think that's kind of like a twofold journey of work um, whilst we're kind of trying to tell people about their rights, we need to work to make sure the legal system's doing that too. So for example, um, like the Human Rights Act, some parts of it don't specifically name um, gender identity as a form of discrimination. So if you're getting um, bullied at work for being trans, for example, the law can't really protect you how it should. And similarly with um, other forms of discrimination we experience, such as hate crimes and things like that, we don't have those protections in place. And um, yeah, I think that's an area we need to definitely do some work in, but I would definitely recommend their website as a kind of, um, thank you, Kelly. Kelly just posted it in the chat. <laughs> And there's also been some really fantastic work done by the Human Rights Commission on this recently. And um, so Tane Polken, Polkinghorn, Pol I'm sorry, Tane, Tane, who has a long and beautiful last name, um, recently wrote a um, report called PRISM. And so it's about human rights issues relating to um, sex characteristics, sexuality, gender in New Zealand. So I'll pop a link to that um, in the chat. That's just come out a couple of months ago and it's um, really beautiful. Oh, fantastic. We'd be interested in uploading that to our community research site as well. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Pooja. Um, have you got some stories about, I'll bring it back to the resource and how the project's kind of having an impact. Um, you've talked about how you're using it. So what's been the feedback from the professionals or how do you know that it's having an impact? Um, I guess from like a frontline perspective, um, most of the time we're finding that the resource is a great kind of, um, I guess, first step for mental health professionals. So young people um, might be referred to a mental health professional through Rambo Youth, we would give them the resource or they might have just find, learned about it themselves. And a lot of the work we do is kind of in the outreach space, so trying to make sure people know about the resource. Um, so I think the feedback's been positive in the way that people um, I guess some of that fear around doing a bad job or getting it wrong if you have a trans or a rainbow client just being confused, that fear is kind of being, um, I guess, reduced, but we're finding that it ends up taking a little bit more work. So um, they might be like, okay, cool. So I know what bisexuality is, but um, might need a little bit more guidance to make sure they know how that understanding can frame the support they provide for the young person. Um, and we've also, I guess, been, um, Red Ruth and Inside Out do a lot of workshops. So we've been working with the New Zealand, we've done a workshop for the New Zealand Association of Counselors um, on just kind of how to support rainbow communities better. And we do get, I guess, um, a lot of smaller community mental health services doing that. So I, yeah, I think the, resource being a bit of a first step to kind of that broader understanding is really what we're seeing. I've got a question here around, is there a kind of a, a list of uh, rainbow friendly counsellors, psychiatrists, doctors available? Um, so Gender Minorities Aotearoa has like a really awesome concise list of um, where to access gender affirming healthcare and also some counsellors. Rainbow Youth also has a list. So if there are any people in this webinar as well that would like us to kind of pop them on the list. Um, definitely would encourage people to get in touch. It's not a big list, it's looking pretty bleak, but I think it can definitely, you know, be built up. But yeah, definitely would recommend the GMA website. We hold one too. I think with the GMA website, um, my understanding is that it's based on recommendations from clients so you would sort of need to be endorsed um by by somebody um to be on there i believe um not 100 percent sure but also depending where about your base i'd recommend getting in touch with your local rainbow organization as well as our national ones because often those kinds of requests are coming to them of where to refer so they would love to know oh there's this rainbow friendly person in my area so um please do that and we keep one um for, for wellington and and um, wherever we hear other people. So, yeah, but as Pooja said, yeah, small list, but most of them aren't, apart from the gender minorities one, they're not public. So the best way is to contact us. So we've got a question in here as well around, um, 
Linking in health and housing, I guess it links to when you're marginalised and discriminated against, some of those life outcomes are not so great. And um, I guess they are seeing perhaps um, a lot of people from the rainbow community who are in the homeless category, or not category, they are homeless. Um, and so is there some specific work that needs to be happening to, I guess, join up those sectors and help them support those communities a lot better than they are? For sure. I think... Um so I guess the rainbow organisations in the country, we have formed a bit of a collective um, to kind of push for some of these issues on a structural level. So that obviously looks like housing, welfare, workplaces and human rights. Um, stay tuned till we release it. But um, that is a huge thing that um, all of our organisations are always trying to fight against because um, emergency housing services, for example, might not be the most safe place for someone to go. Um, I mentioned before that a lot of people say we don't get those kinds of people here and that is what we hear all the time from housing providers and similarly in the health sector I think um, again that kind of fear and, and lack of understanding and just feeling like um, you know we they're not our clients like they go somewhere else um, that's a huge barrier to even I guess getting through the door of those services let alone um, waiting on a wait list and then waiting to see if um, you'll be put in, for example, with emergency housing services, they are often quite gendered. So for um, trans and non-binary people, it might not necessarily be somewhere where they feel really comfortable. Um, sometimes places are like shared accommodation, so there's some safety issues in there. Um, yeah, I think the housing sector definitely needs a lot of work. And like Laurie said at the beginning, everything kind of comes down to funding. Um, there's a lot we can do with the kind of advocacy piece, but we need kind of strong commitments to make sure that this is being prioritised as like a, you know, on a structural level and making sure that we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is with that. And um, also good to note that there's some really, really good research being done about rainbow homelessness at the moment. So um, Tycho Vandenberg in Auckland, I believe, and Brody Fraser in Wellington are both doing PhDs. Um, Tycho on trans homelessness and Brody, I think, on rainbow homelessness more generally. Um, and I think they're both in the process of their PhDs, so I'd be watching out for um, some of their work that will hopefully come out over the next couple of years. And to my knowledge, they're also both taking a community-based approach to that. That's fantastic. I'm going to, I said I wasn't going to ask this question, but have you seen any, um, any policies that uh, have been coming out, you know, over the election that, that show that certain parties, I guess, are, are taking, you know, inclusion and their responsibility to rainbow communities more seriously than others? And what are some good examples of proposed policies? Go on, Tammy. <laughs> Um, Tabby, do you, do you want to go? But I have an um, Instagram page to plug relevant to this. Yeah, awesome. So I guess, unfortunately, we've been really disappointed that there's a very, very um, small number of, of policies or parties with policies that support rainbow communities. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty dire. Uh, so I would recommend the Rainbow Election Tool website. I think it's rainbowelectiontool.nz. Maybe someone could put it in the chat, please. Um, and that shows you across, so it's kind of... Um, uh, the Rainbow Law Group at um, University of Auckland have worked alongside organisations like Inside Out and Rainbow Youth um, and our youth sector Rainbow Collective put together a list of um, demands, which I'll let Pooja say if it's been published anywhere yet, um, of kind of what we're wanting to see um, for Rainbow communities um, in policies and, and so on. Um, so we've been quite clear on what we're asking for, but um, this, this website sort of um, puts those things out there and then kind of shows which parties have what policies. The majority of parties have no policies. Um, it's one party that has um, very anti policies. Um, so that would be very harmful. Um, you can name and, that party if you want, Tabby. Yeah, so the new conservatives um, have got really, really dangerous, harmful policies against our community. So um, please don't vote for them. Um, <laughs> <and> <laughs> Um, no shame in saying that it's, um, you know, it's, it would actually be harmful. Um, yeah, so the Green Party have really comprehensive um, policies that pretty much meet everything um, that rainbow communities are asking for, which is awesome. They also have um, a huge number of rainbow candidates, even within their top 10. So that's really impressive to see that representation, both in policies and in um, their candidates. Um, and the Labour Party... Um, 
do have some um, policy and support, but not quite to the same level. Um, so yeah, those are the only two parties that have supportive policies. Um, so yeah, we definitely recommend you um, considering marginalised communities such as rainbow communities when you are making your decision to vote. Am I right in thinking that Elizabeth Kirikiri, who um, has done those incredible Takatapu resources, is in the Greens list top 10? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I know that it's not always, um, not everyone loves us shouting about our political opinions, but I'll be voting to tick screen in this election. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're a Labour voter, Give your vote to the Green Party so you get some of those amazing MPs in the top 10s Greens list in because we need the Greens to keep Labour on the, on the right side. Well, thank you, Wahine Ma. We're coming to the tail end of our session. We've got about another um, three to five minutes. And I'm just wondering if you've got, I guess, some, uh, some final comments or thoughts or challenges really to lay down to our participants today. Oh, challenge. Definitely don't have a challenge, but I guess like a final comment would just be um, to summarise all of the fancy words we said today. The main one is just get amongst the learning and get in touch with people and kind of build those relationships face to face. Um, someone also made a really good um, note about PATHA. So that's the Professional Association for Transgender Health Aotearoa. Um, would also recommend checking out their website for a whole bunch of research and um, resources. And yeah, just kind of don't be afraid and make sure everybody else in the workplace isn't either. I think fear really stops people from being able to kind of make actual change happen. So um, just get out there, ask a workshop from one of us. There'll always be someone out there keen to do a workshop, um, making sure those kind of changes don't just happen with the frontline workers, but the high level stuff. So then we can hopefully kind of get up there in the structural game too. Yeah, that's my little tidbit. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I would say um, download or order the resource and the posters, put them up in your spaces, read the resource, distribute it to your colleagues who couldn't be here today, people that you know. Um, yeah, it will really help. Um, and um, yeah, and then um, reach out to one of our organizations for training as well if, if possible or kind of um, if you're not in a position to kind of approve that really advocate for it because um, that kind of face-to-face -face opportunity and opportunity like today there's been so many questions so thank you for all of those um, yeah is, is a really meaningful way to to build upon um, what is in the resource um, yeah and if you're a researcher um, yeah invite us invite us to be um, part of that design kind of um, process before you're wanting to um, get to the recruitment part of it. Uh, yeah, um, and I just want to acknowledge there's been a lot of kind of questions that have come through around specific like regions or services or um, some of you might be practitioners actually really just wanting really practical practical information because you're dealing with a young person or things like that. So um, yeah, just if your questions weren't answered or you, um, you're still looking for support, please feel free to reach out to our organisations. So um, insideout.org.nz, ry.org.nz um genderminorities.com um we can put those in the chat because um we're all here here to help all of the time so yeah please never um hesitate to get in touch with us for support yeah, um and i just want to come back to a word that Pooja used earlier which was um compassion and i think that you know if we all operate from that place of compassion you can't really go wrong um the specifics will all kind of sort themselves out but if you come from a place of real kindness and understanding then that's really what people are looking for and that's in mental health context but also in any other context um, and I just wanted to say again thank you everybody for coming and watching us um, and to give my real thanks to the community organizations who walked alongside me for my PhD. Um, Tabby said that I was careful with their time but in reality um, you all gave a lot of time to me and for me and yeah it really meant a lot to me. Um, and when I defended my PhD recently, I found myself getting a little bit teary towards the end of my talk. So yeah, this is, um, it's been a really incredible journey for me. And I just want to yeah, thank everybody who's had some part to play in it. So yeah, kia ora. Kia ora, Gloria. Oh, kia ora, wahine ma. Um, gee, we're getting a lot of thanks and uh, positive feedback in the, in the chat. Um, we encourage participants to post any outstanding questions on our Facebook um, community research discussion group and hopefully our awesome team here will have a chance to get on in the next uh, few days and 
respond to them. I'd like to mahi to you, Wahine Ma, Gloria Tabi and Puja, for sharing your wero, your whakaro and your inspiration with us today. We've got both challenges and opportunities to reimagine and build our communities, our organisations and our nation to support future generations to thrive and reach their full potential. And um, yeah, so, you know, I think that uh, people have taken a lot on board. There's been so much sharing of some amazing resources and organisations who are out there to help, help us all do better in our journeys. Um, our next webinar is on the 30th of October and focuses on New Zealand community research ethics. So uh, we'll be bringing up some of the kōrero from this at that session. Um, we'll also be launching at that uh, webinar, our formally launching our updated community research code of practice which has been uploaded already to our website. So interested in your feedback on that. And please join our Community Research Facebook page and Community Research Discussion Group again. You can subscribe to our monthly e-news e by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. Thank you all for joining us today. And the video copy of our webinar with Gloria, Puja and Tabby will be uploaded to share with colleagues and friends later on this week. And I'd like to thank you all. My biggest heartfelt thanks to you all your time today. Mauri ora, kia koutou, kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. The Community Research website offers a hub for good community research and researchers. It's the place for the public to find and share evidence about effective community practices. The website collects research and evidence and organises these so that they can be easily accessed and used by other groups. You can access this research and browse by category, by a list of quick link topics, or by searching for something specific. All of the research is free to download. The Community Research site is all about excellence and effective practices. You can view recordings of past webinars and find out about future ones. The webinars share evidence about what's working in the community sector. Published by Community Research in 2007, the Code of Practice provides the standards and guidelines for doing research. It's the place to start if you're thinking of undertaking research with or in a community or iwi. As well as the collection of research, we keep a register of experienced researchers who are skilled at working with iwi and communities. To find a researcher who can help you, we have a filter system which allows you to find people based on location, qualification, ethnic group and area of expertise. The Community Research website is a unique resource for the community sector to use and share. It matters because communities who learn well will do well. It matters because it evidences what's working for us. For researchers and community people alike, we've made it as easy as possible to share your research on our website. Kowa e whakama. Uploading material is quick and simple. Save your work as a PDF and head over to Share Research. Answer a few questions that help us tag and organize the research so it's easy for people to find. If you're a researcher and skilled at working with communities, you can add your details to the directory of researchers so that you can be found. Community research keeps you updated and informed. This helps make you more effective. If you want to stay updated about the latest research, informed about new resources and our upcoming webinars, Head over to sign up for our e-news on the home page. Community research is a rich resource built for and by the community. For it to reach maximum potential, we rely on you to contribute, participate and support the resource to grow and thrive. Mā te kotahitanga e ora ai tātou.